video. All right, totally different category of piano than, than the, the pianos that we've been talking about for the last several weeks. So of course, the pianos we've been talking about for the last several weeks, they're like entire rebuilds. So it's, it's a lot of these kinds of pianos where they're generally 1890 to 1930. There are some exceptions on either side, but for the most part, they're, they're in, that, in that category. By the way, the, the reason for 1890, this is just kind of an interesting um, tangent tidbit, is 1890 is kind of the, the point at which the middle class was able to, and, and I guess manufacturing kind of caught up to, to the point where the status symbol of a piano became affordable for most people, and that was, that was a United States thing. In Europe, it was still very much a, an aristocratic, expensive thing because they weren't manufacturing to the same uh, level that they, so, so essentially they were doing what Henry Ford invented before Henry Ford was doing it. Like they were, they were doing the mass production kinds of things like yeah. soundboard, yeah, a, a, a line, but also they were also doing a lot of manufacturing of like soundboards in one location. In, I think it was the late 80s, late 1880s, that 90% uh, that of all soundboards in every piano, literally of thousands of different manufacturers, 90% of soundboards were supplied by one manufacturer. So we'd make the soundboards, ship them out all over the country to these manufacturers, and then they'd put them in. Action, same thing. So you've heard of like Wessel, Nickel, and Gross, or there are a number of other um, uh, action manufacturers. They would manufacture the actions um, in one location, and then, and then manufacturers would purchase them and install them in their pianos. Legs, piano legs, so, so we've all noticed, obviously, how incredibly ornate a lot of these pianos from this era. They're super ornate legs. There were companies that were manufacturing just piano legs. They weren't manufacturing table legs or chair legs, just piano legs. That's it. Not pianos, just legs. Okay. Anyway, tangent. That has nothing to do with this, except that that's not what this is. This piano is more, uh, is more I would characterize this as more like, so this, this kind of style of streamlined, um, stream, streamlined cabinet and 48 inches generally, I think this one is 48. Yeah, it's a 121, which is centimeters. So generally, if you see 121 or 131 or 125, that's centimeters or 118 on, on an upright. Um, yeah, centimeters, all of you non-Americans. Um, so centimeters is 48 inches or, or one, 121 centimeters is 48 inches. Okay, so this, this kind of style of piano became, became a thing like in the late 60s. You don't really see this before that, maybe a little bit, but it became really pretty ubiquitous by like 19, well, by 1970 for sure. And so they've just been manufactured, they've kind of spread throughout all manufacturers and they all kind of have their version of the black and shiny streamlined 48 inch boxy look um, so <clears throat> now now you know here we are what like 50 years out or 40 years out or so from from when the, a lot of these were manufactured this one I don't think is that old this one might be might be I don't know 20 or 30 years old something like that but uh, but a lot of them need to be refurbished so they don't need the full rebuild like these like these pianos that we're talking about in the 1890 to 1930 period those were really, really well built, but right, nothing can withstand 100 years. Like that is such an incredibly long time that they just need to be rebuilt. These pianos, they're also fairly well rebuilt, they're, or fairly well built originally, but they, they're not to the point where they need to be totally rebuilt yet. And so, um, so that's what we're gonna be doing on this. Um, it's, it's obviously a much less, um, labor-intensive process, much less materials-intensive process, and of course that means for the customer a much less expensive process. It's still, it's still, um, it's still somewhat expensive, but, uh, but not anywhere near the cost of a rebuild. Um, last thing I'll say about that, um, I had a thought. I wanted to mention about those. I'll think of it.
So when you oh, I remember. Yeah, no, Hubert. please. I rem I'll, I'll remember it. Okay. Go ahead. So when we do a refurb, mm -hmm. it, it seems like our objective is to get the piano back to as close to new as possible. That's right. And it just as what you're saying, it just doesn't take that much, as much as obviously. The to the same extent. That's right. Piano. Exactly. But we're still trying to get it back to as close to new as possible. That's right. Yeah. If, if your mic, if, if my mic isn't picking up your voice, Mike just asked, the, the goal is still to get it as close to brand new as we can, like our goal is, is with these old pianos, but it just doesn't take as much, as much work, and that, that is absolutely right. As a general rule, while pianos last forever, they never just die, they, always, it's, they slowly fade. They last, you know, 100 years or 150 years. Uh, Mike's working on a piano right now that's 151 years. We've got a piano in the front vestibule that's, 100, that's 1840s. So what is that, 170 years. They last forever with rebuilding and with maintenance and care. That said, as a general rule, they have about 20 to 25 years of really good use of where, where, where the, the regulation is basically correct, the voicing is good, the hammers are good, the pinning is good. It's going to be relatively problem-free with sticking keys and pedals and that sort of thing. They have about 20 to 25 years. Most pianos, they don't get a refurbishing after 20 to 25 years, but they need it. They're to the point where, where it ought to be done. And so that's what we're going to be doing on this piano. We're going through everything as thoroughly as we can and um, just kind of redoing everything short of replacing parts. We, we, we shouldn't need to replace parts. Um, Hardly at all. Maybe a string will break, or maybe a flange, or something. But for the most part, we won't. We won't need to. So, <coughs> aside from the obvious things, we'll we'll probably polish out the cabinetry. Maybe fix um, fix a handful of cabinetry issues if it has any. I don't know. Maybe polish the pedals and and buff the buff the. This is polyester. Um, buff that all out so that all of these surface scratches are taken care of. But the majority of the majority of the work is on the inside. So, on the inside, let's. Uh, why don't we listen to it first? Maybe. Mechanical issues? Are you hearing the mechanical issues? Can you spot the problems? Okay, so so just just playing all eighty-eight notes. What do you notice? Loose hammers. Okay, loose hammers. Good. What else? Lots of clicking. Lots of clicking. Right. Yeah. That's that's loose hammers, or or it could be other loose parts. Yeah. yeah clicking. Clicking could be. For the most part, it's loose hammers. The vast majority of that. Uh, the other. The other uh, clicking causes could be loose whippins. It could be loose glue joints, right? That's, that's actually a pretty common one. Even, even on these pianos that are only, I don't know, 20 or 30 years old, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll pull the hammer forward and I'll, I'll support it and just, just kind of feel on the, the catcher there. Because sometimes I... Uh, You'll, you'll feel a loose glue joint there on the catcher, and that causes a bad click. A lot of Kawhis from the 1990s, but you know, now 30 years later, are are clicking badly because of loose um, catchers. And I see that not just Kawhis, but on a lot of different pianos. Okay, what else did you hear? Can I try to ask a question about that? Sure. Is that particularly worse on? Hammers and weapons that are plastic. Or okay, is it worse on on plastic parts? Um, it seems it. Yeah, I can't say definitively, but my experience is yes. Okay, that's what I thought. That is not a wide study, but yeah, it is. Um, it's not, it's not to the point where, 
I, and, and I think, well, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll end it there. <laughs> I won't push that further. Okay, you hear anything else? It's pretty, for me, it's pretty bright. Pretty bright, yeah, I agree. That it, it's a pretty obnoxious tone yeah. overall. And if you look, why don't, why don't everybody look at the hammers? We're gonna be reshaping the hammers and we're gonna be then realigning them. We'll do some voicing probably. It's just a, it's just a really obnoxious sound really obnoxious tone. What do you think about the, the, uh, those string cuts? Those are deeper than I expected. Pretty deep. I think they've been playing it. Yeah, yeah, they <laughs> have. It's not just sitting there. Totally, yeah. yeah. This piano has had a lot of use, um, and, that's, and that's probably the, the easiest way to, to check is how deep those hammer cuts are, those string cuts. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So when we reshape them, um, we'll, we'll um, especially if you if you do them in the gang with the gang file, right? The the big thick uh, sandpaper sanding paddle, as opposed to trying to do one at a time. Down here, you have to do one at a time because of the angle, but but up here, you use the gang file. It'll it should fix mostly, not 100%, but it should mostly fix what's called the mating, the the hammer to string mating, um, which we can we can get into that maybe in a future uh, training. But uh, basically, if you push the hammer gently towards the string so it's touching the string. And that also incidentally pulls the damper away. You just kind of gently touch the hammer to the string, then you pluck all three notes. Okay, so the, the two on the, the first two, the left one, the middle one, they're, they're muted out fairly well by the, by the hammer, and then the third one rings. Did you hear that a little bit? It rings a little bit. So that's mating, right? You want, you want that hammer to hit exactly, exactly the same, and that's, and that's part of voicing and part of getting that, that nasally tone that causes, uh, um, it just sounds, it, it doesn't sound as good when the, when the, when the strings aren't mated or the, the hammer's not mated. Okay. It's a third less powerful, a third less. May I, I think it has more to do with tone than power because it's still there's still some give to the. The, the difference is, is very slight, which is why why you only push, push that hammer gently against the string. Because if I push hard, so what note was that? I think it was that one. So if I push, you know, if I give it any kind of pressure. It just mutes it out entirely. But if it's very, very light, then, then you can get a sense of, of how the mating is. Okay, any other observations? So we've got loose parts, we've got, we've got obnoxious bright tone, maybe that some nasally tone. Um, I feel like the keys are. Okay, that's a good observation. Yeah, no, they're not. Why don't you get the camera down here and sight just the opposite of where I'm looking. And you can see all sorts of up and down. Yeah. So it's, and, and, and there are also some spacing issues. What about that kind of alignment in the middle section? Just looking at this where they come up. Oh, this? Yeah. Okay, so that is done um, to miss the damper. That's that's intentional. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine if they're aligned in that, <laughs> like not lined up correctly. Oh, because it doesn't look good. <laughs> so it must not sound good. <laughs> no, that's that's a that's a compromise for the overstrung. Bad. Yeah, no, it doesn't look that bad. Right. Okay. Um, 
we can we can infer just by just by looking at it. There's there are probably lots of pinning issues. We we don't necessarily hear that. I I don't know that I know how to hear it, but that's that's definitely something we can infer. I also do you hear that? The broken register. Oh yeah, yes we do. Nice. The what? Broken bridle strap. You have a bent capstan um, just on the bass section, second from the right. Yep. Okay. And did anybody hear the? This is this is just an initial. I mean, usually usually I'll I'll just kind of play everything, and 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 these things should kind of go through your mind. Like, I mean, we're we're talking about it for five or ten minutes, but it should go through your mind instantly as you as you play it. Here's another one that that I found. <laughs> So it might be the same thing. It might be this spring. I mean, that spring. What do we do about that spring? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We felt through it. That ought to do it. I don't know if that was it or not. Okay, there's something else. There's something else going on. It might be um, the, uh, the, the rod back here might be rattling on, um, on its little lever, maybe. But it's something something that that for sure ought to be ought to be looked at. Okay, let's. It could be a cheery under the key, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> yeah. let's check the. Uh, well, look at that. What do you notice there? Lots of lost motion. Lots of lost motion. Okay, that's way way. I mean, there shouldn't really be any. Um, if we pull on the, if we tug on the rest rail, all the hammers definitely do follow, mm -hmm. right? Which is a good thing. Um, but there's way too much lost motion. Okay, let's check our let off. Whoa, look at that let off. That's just way too far back. You see that? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay, so for all you viewers at home, that distance right there where the hammer pulls away from the string, right there, that's referred to as the, the let off distance or the escapement. That's supposed to be an eighth of an inch. Um, and that looks to me like about an inch or so, or I don't know. That's that's really far. So okay. So obviously regulation issues. What else? Checking. Okay, I don't like the way the 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 checking isn't isn't like nice and nice and precise. The distance isn't very good either. Oh, and look at that. That's an issue. <laughs> And I heard I heard some cracking in there. That's probably a. There's another one. Yeah, probably. Okay, so I'm I'm putting constant pressure under here. So so the fir first thing is I'm feeling for um, for any kind of play in the in the hole to the shank. And then to get it to get it all the way off like that, you, you can't just pull it off because it's still relatively tight. So, so just give it constant pressure under here, kind of pry with your finger as you as you wiggle it up. Um, there's another one. Okay, so so we got to find some more of those. That that could also be another cause of clicking, but I'm sure I'm sure the screws are crazy loose too. Um, Okay, obviously we're going to clean it. It's not it's not actually as dirty as, you know, many of it that we've done, right Jake? Oh. Um there's another something that we can we can address later. We don't need to address it now, but but we just need to hopefully make at least a mental note that when we put this piano back together, we want to address that. So right now, this fall board is it's supposed to stop uh, uh, sorry thank you kneeboard thanks Jake it's supposed to stop immediately after the spring kind of locks down uh, there you can see the spring um, where the spring kind of uh, makes a mark in the dust so you can hear the spring lock into place right 
maybe. Like, it's yeah, it's out of its out of its little track maybe there. Okay. There it locks into place, but then it kind of keeps going a little further. There's a little bit more. So we'll probably just install some felt maybe behind there. Oh look, there's a little little nub of a center pin which tells me that um, looks like something's been worked on. Yeah. Right there? Um, right there. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, that's more like it. It's a little bit dirtier down there. Oh. Look. There's this. I wonder if that's. That's probably what the buzz was. So we'll clean it thoroughly. Um, bridges look okay. I'm not. I'm not concerned about that. Curtis knows all about that. Curtis has done a lot of bridges lately. And then, uh, and then Curtis, why don't you check up there? Any cracks in the bridge up there that you can see? Hard to see the whole thing, but it looks it looks just fine. Okay. I noticed the the mute pedal is off, and just aesthetically, it bothers me that it's lower than the other. Oh yeah, good, yeah. good. That's a great observation. I don't like that. Yeah, that's a great observation. Nice. Yeah, it's just really weak. It looks like. Uh, so there's a spring. Oh, and there's another center pin down here. That uh, looks like somebody's been working on it. Okay, there's a spring under there that's supposed to push it up, but it's I can see it, but it's it doesn't even touch the spring until it gets right there. Now it's touching the spring. So that spring is just exhausted. So we can either kind of reintroduce some bend in that spring or we can just install a new one either way. Okay. Anyway, so that's um a any other observations? No. Okay. We uh I don't know, we might be able to well, that the mute rail spring is elongated. Yeah. Half of it. I don't know uh -huh. if you mentioned that, but yeah, we might we might want to do something there. Okay. Here's kind of an interesting side note. This this piano does have a full perimeter plate, right? You got struts here. I don't know if you can see the strut there. Compare that with. So we've got a strut, strut right here on the plate, strut over there. Yeah. So, um, the Hyloon uh, P series, they do it. Not the 121s, but the P's do. This is this is generally the the design where it's kind of this triangular shape at the bottom, and there's nothing here or there. Or yeah, piano yeah, right behind Mike there. Call that a full perimeter. Fro full perimeter plate. Mm -hmm. Is there an advantage to that? Um, I suspect so. Yeah. I. I've I've never done any piano design, but I would assume that it just because the plate is essentially the I mean that's like the core structure all of the tension is being held by that plate. So adding an extra strut on either side, I would assume makes it stronger and just helps with your tuning stability and kind of brings that whole plate together. Yeah, maybe. So my, my guess is if there's an advantage, it would be in tuning stability.
Yeah, that's right. I guess the other thing that I'll point out is um, oh, I've got sluggish keys. See those? How they, they're sluggish. It basically, we're, we're, it's out of tune, right? But basically, we're in tune, which tells me we probably have a good, good torque, good torque on these pins, most likely. So we probably won't have to do our CA glue treatment or anything like that. So, I mean, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take our time with this piano. We'll make it, you know, like we were talking about earlier, we'll make this piano as, as in, in as good condition as we can. Um, we, we've talked about, you know, all of these things kind of separately, but what, what we're doing just today in this training, and, and we'll start to break out in future trainings, um, but what we're doing just in this training is, is just kind of your first analysis. When you come across a piano like this that's, you know, in that, like 1960 to 2000 era, these, these are pretty common things. These are pretty normal things. All of these things um, in conjunction with each other are gonna make this piano a pretty awful experience to play as it is. But you can see that they really don't, the hammers don't need to be replaced. The dampers don't need to repl be replaced. The keys, right Corbin, the keys look pretty good. They just need to be leveled and squared and spaced. Um, uh, on um, the question I was going to ask is on the set of those uh, bass keys, a couple of keys you played, how they come up kind of rather slowly. Mm -hmm. um, what too. combination of things that, because I know that could be, um, from my experience, that could be due to pushing your CD loop being too tight, but could the action regulation also affect whether it, could. it comes up? Yeah, sure it could. Comes up slow? Yeah, you're right. Most of the time it is, it is bushings. So what we can do is we can just push these, push these out of the way, and so so we've now separated right the action from the back of the, and then I'm definitely feeling, so it's a bushing issue on this, and then another kind of confirmation of that is if I keep these keep the um, the notes up, and then just kind of. There doesn't seem to be any kind of sluggishness in the in the action, so that that's another double confirmation that the issue is in the key, front rail bushing or balance rail. I don't know. Another problem could be the balance rail hole, which um, we talked about uh, a little bit earlier, where you ream out the balance rail hole a little bit. It could be. Generally, you want you want to be able to lift that key up. And then as you release it, it should kind of slowly come down on its own like that. So where these are um, already too loose, you could have, yeah, we've got some pulley key issues and there are, there are repairs for that. Pulley keys are where it kind of goes back and forth like this. So that's a, that's a clue when they're flopping down so quickly like that. And that's something that, depending on how bad it is, maybe we'll address it, maybe not. It's Okay? Does that give you a good idea of how to kind of evaluate, make, make mental notes? The last thing that I'll say is, on those mental notes, that, that it really, it's, it's those fine details that cause um, customers to be unsatisfied. Um, or have any kind of you know callback or warranty issues, because like all of the other stuff, we got that right. We got let off. We got the reshaping, all the regluing, repairs, the repinning, leveling, squaring, spacing, taking up the lost motion, determining the correct blow distance, all of that stuff. That's like we're gonna nail that 100%. But, but what really takes it to the very next level is, is taking care of things like the buzzes and the rattles and fixing, fixing little, little things like that, fixing, well, this, this should probably be obvious, but you know, ensuring that there aren't any, any sluggish keys. Um, what else? Rattles in the pedal, or you know, that's, that's like taking it to the, to the next level. So, or, or the, the kneeboard, that kneeboard had, had a squeak in it or, or a rattle. 
um, and that could that could cause um, cause issues. Distract distraction. Okay. All right. We'll pick it up next time.